welcome to language arts for today. For today, you are going to need your white binder, your language arts materials packet, and your copy of Little Women. Oh, and I should have said a pencil. You'll need a pencil too. If you need to go get any of those things, go do so now, and then come on back. So yesterday, you guys took the test. Um, all of those scores have been released, so if you have not looked at how you did, you can go back and you can kind of click on the test and see how you did with those answers. And then also, um, you can um, read my feedback as well. So if you haven't had a chance to go do that, you can do that now. Um, so for today, we actually have two objectives. One, we're going to be introducing little women. So in order to do that, we're going to need this background information sheet that you should be able to find from when you picked up your materials. And then we're gonna jump into the first chapter and be working on characterizing the main characters, okay? So at this point, let's go ahead and get this sheet out. And as usual, if I have it, you have it. So we're gonna be filling in these notes together and you guys should be writing down what I'm writing down. So I'm gonna go ahead and flip you guys around so that we can get into our note taking. All right, so this is the background information that'll be useful for understanding how or what this story is about. So first of all, the American Civil War. This story takes place during the American Civil War, and so here's some information about the American Civil War. A lot of this you may have been exposed to in your fourth grade history, um, but still worth taking a look at. So the American Civil War took place from 1861 to 1865. As a reminder, again, if I'm writing it down, you should be writing it down so you can add these notes as you go. And remember, of course, that, again, one of the benefits right now is that you can pause me. So if you need to pause me for these notes, feel free. The primary reason for the American Civil War was whether or not to allow slavery. Okay, so this idea that people were um, enslaving others um, and we know this from, you know, kidnapped from Africa and then taken to America and forced into slavery. And so this was the primary reason behind the American Civil War. The Northern, or also known as Union states, were not in support of slavery. However, the Southern, or Confederate states, were in support of slavery. And so this led them to have a civil war about this. Over 620,000 soldiers died during the American Civil War, making it the deadliest war in American history. More deadly than World War I and World War II combined. So what this means is that many families lost loved ones during this war. So it's worth pointing out, America is fighting itself. So that would increase the number of deaths, right? If you're fighting another country, then there's deaths on both sides. But when a country fights itself, then, you know, most, almost all of the deaths become American deaths. But really this part is the, the part to think about for the text at this point is that really it was affecting people everywhere, that they were losing sons and brothers and uncles and fathers in the war who were fighting over this issue, okay? This book is called Little Women, and so there's just some things to note about women during the American Civil War. So during the American Civil War, women were left to take care of the household since fathers and sons were drafted to fight in the war. Okay, so women were those who were behind and they were kind of taking up new jobs and really taking care of the household and responsible for all parts of it since the men were off fighting. It's also worth noting though that women had very few rights at this time, okay? So thinking back, I mean, we're talking hundreds of years ago, right? And things have changed uh, quite a bit since then in terms of this, but at this point in time, women would really not have a lot of rights or freedoms. Um, in terms of like society and how they expected them to act, women were expected to behave in a feminine and appropriate manner so that they would be considered good marriage material. OK, 
okay? So at this time, that was really like the main goal, the main expectation for women was um, to be able to find someone to marry you, okay? That they wanted, that was your job basically, was like you need to behave in a certain way, you need to be proper, you need to be feminine, you need to be appropriate, because that's the only way you're gonna get someone to marry you. And that was like the goal, the only thing that women were expected to do, okay? Um, and pretty limiting. We're gonna see not all of the characters in the books in the book are fans of these expectations, of this belief that they should behave in this appropriate or fem female feminine way quote unquote, I should say. Typically, women were only allowed to have domestic jobs. And that word domestic, actually think of your Latin roots. This is about related to the home, jobs that are things that happen in or around a home, right? So things like being a seamstress or being a cook. But I mentioned this already. However, women began filling jobs that were left vacant, which is another word for empty, by the men fighting in the war. So during the American Civil War, there was a little bit more freedom because they needed people to do the jobs and the only people around to do the jobs um, were men, okay? This whole thing about women during this time, it's gonna come up repeatedly in the book. And again, some of the characters are fine with it, others really resist it, and we're gonna see how this affects them as we go through the text, okay? I wanna talk a little bit about education because it's going to come up. And this shouldn't be, some of these things you'll maybe be more prepared for because of having just read Ichabod and The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. But, okay, so education. Wealthy children attended private schools with one teacher per like three or four children. So it was almost like tutoring at this point. You've got three or four children with one teacher, okay? Getting very specialized attention, okay? Poor children attended public schools with one teacher per like 20 or 30 students in a grade. So this is a lot more um, <clears throat> like what we see, right? This idea of a lot of people in one room and also kind of still a little bit like we saw in Ichabod in Le Legend of Sleepy Hollow that maybe there was a mix of grades, ages in these classrooms, okay? Corporal punishment was more common in public schools. So this word corporal, again, relating to your Latin roots, this word corpus, which you can think of some derivatives of this as well, but corpus means body. So a corpse, right, is a derivative of that word, um, which is a dead body, right? But corporal, coming from the word corpus, which means body is the idea that it's punishment that occurs on the body. So think of Ichabod Crane and the legend of Sleepy Hollow, right? We know that he was quote unquote educating his students using this sort of discipline, this, this physical discipline. And so we'll see a little bit of this again. And at the time, I mean, we hear it now, right? And it's shocking because it's something we don't do anymore. But at the time, it was not uncommon to have corporal punishment be used in schools. Okay. Many of the poorest children did not attend school at all, but worked to make money for their families. And their working would be in things like factories where they were being, being, they'd be doing very difficult manual labor in order to make money for their families. It would not be pleasant circumstances. Finally, women did not attend college. Their job was, as I mentioned, to find a husband and start a family. So girls would go to school for a while, but eventually they'd stop. Eventually their job just became, okay, now you have to learn how to take care of a house and you have to look beautiful because that's what you need in order to find yourself a husband. And that was kind of the goal, right? And I think, again, there were some limitations because women didn't have a lot of job options. And so to find this meant that you would be taken care of and secure. Um, but again, limiting. If all you can do are sort of these domestic jobs, you don't really go to school for very long, and in the end, you're just trying to find a husband. So themes in Little Women. Remember what we've talked about, that themes are these sort of main ideas or messages of the story, what the author really wants us to be thinking about, okay? So we're going to touch on some themes throughout Little Women, and you'll see that there's a themes chart in your uh, materials packet. You don't need to do anything with that 
until I tell you to do so. So you can just leave it there. But themes, these are some of the big ideas that we're going to be thinking about in this book. So first, Little Women focuses on the role of women and the limitations of women at this time. So there's a lot of reflection on how women were expected to act and whether this is appropriate or acceptable or not. And as I mentioned, some of the characters are okay with it and others really kind of resist some of it, okay? So we see that this will be a theme that comes up, this idea that the author is getting us to think about, okay? Little Women also focuses on the importance of hard work and living a virtuous life, okay? So... We'll see this coming throughout, and the character, the family in this book, this main family, they're a Christian family, so their religion is Christianity, and so there's, I mean, it's not throughout, but there's this kind of theme a little bit here and there, that when they reflect on virtue, they're thinking about it from the perspective of their religion, and it'll come up a little bit, but again, just the idea in general that being virtuous, regardless of religion, is something that the author wants her readers to be reflecting on as an important thing. Okay, and then finally, Little Women also looks at the relationship between wealth, wealth meaning like money, wealth, and happiness. Okay, so she's asking this question, our author is asking this question, does more money make you happy? Okay, and again, we're going to see different characters having different perspectives. Some of these characters really do believe that if they had more money, it would make them happier. But there's also something they're wrestling with, they're thinking about, they're being challenged with. So there's this reflection a little bit about it. So as we go through the book, these are three of the themes that we're going to be considering as we go, okay? So fifth graders, once you have got these notes finished, again, this just gets us a little bit of perspective as we get started. You're going to put these notes into the reading section of your white binder, okay? Again, the reading section of your white binder for you to keep. So with that, fifth graders, we're going to get into chapter one. So our objective for chapter one is that we're going to be trying to characterize the girls. So there are four sisters in this story, and we're going to be introduced to all of them, okay? And we're going to be getting a little bit of description of them. And so your job, above all, in most of your homework today is going to be finding quotes that are going to tell us a little bit more about who they are, what, they, what makes them tick, how they uh, act, okay? So I'm going to show you your homework questions, okay, and then we'll get so right as into as with it. all of our homework fifth, uh, fifth graders, you have those multiple choice, but then when you're doing short answer questions, you want to make sure you're restating the question and as many words from the question as you can in your answer. We've been practicing it throughout the year, so hopefully you guys are feeling like it's getting to be pretty second nature, but remember that you want to keep doing that. So question one asks us, where is the girl's father? The next four questions are all very similar. What is one quote that describes Meg? So you'd say one quote that describes Meg is blank. What is one quote that describes Joe? You'd say one quote that describes Joe is blank. What is one quote that describes Beth? One quote that describes Beth is blank. What is one quote that describes Amy? One quote that describes Amy is blank. So you're going to pick just one brief quote for each of these. And again, your goal is to try and capture something about the girls and their character, each of them, okay? Finally, question six says, which of the following sentences correctly uses the word fret, okay? Remember, I always provide vocabulary words for you in the instructions. So if you're wondering, go back and look at the definitions there. So as we move to the book, fifth graders, there's a lot of stuff that comes before the story even starts, okay? So we see there's kind of a chronological piece of information about Louisa May Alcott and some dates about her. Um, this book is somewhat autobiographical in that she sort of wrote some, it's fiction, but some of the characters, one in particular, kind of based off of her own experiences. So it's not like this is the story of her life, but there she does sort of have this, there's this uh, speculation of her connection to one of these characters. Okay, and then there's a lengthy introduction, which you see with all these little Roman, Roman numerals in the upper left and right hand corner, okay? And then we get to the title page, and then there's a little preface, and then the table of contents, and then we get to part one. So really, this is where we want to be looking, is this part one, okay? 
Um, we're only going to read the first part of this book. We're not going to read the entire thing, just that first part, okay? So with that, we should be looking at what says page 11, okay? The first chapter. And you'll notice that there's going to be footnotes throughout that the editor or potentially Louisa May Alcott herself, that you'll see a little bit of both, providing explanation of things that showed up in the story. So we'll stop and talk about them sometimes and other times we won't. This is a good reminder that while I'm reading fifth graders, you should be reading along with eyes on the page. And that's what's really going to help your reading to improve is to make sure that you're following along while I'm reading. Okay. So with that, Playing Pilgrims. This is going to be a reference to a book. I mentioned in the notes that they are a Christian family. And so um, there's this book, Pilgrim's Progress, that the girls have read. And it kind of is woven a little bit throughout the book, um, this connection to... Uh, the story. And again, it's a little linked to their Christian religion as well. So with that, Christmas won't be Christmas without any presents, grumbled Joe lying on the rug. It's so dreadful to be poor, sighed Meg, looking down at her old dress. I don't think it's fair for some girls to have plenty of pretty things and other girls nothing at all, added little Amy with an injured sniff. We've got mother and father and each other said Beth contentedly from her corner. The four young faces on which the firelight shone brightened at the cheerful words, but darkened again as Joe said sadly, we haven't got father and shall not have him for a long time. She didn't say perhaps never, but each silently added it, thinking of father far away where the fighting was. So that was our answer to number one, okay? We have to infer a little bit here, okay? They, Joe says, we haven't got father and shan't for or shall not for a long time. And then they all kind of silently think, maybe never. So why would they maybe never see their father again? Right? They're saying if he dies while he's fighting, which remember our notes that many, many, many hundreds of thousands of Americans died. So it's very possible. So if he died, they wouldn't ever have him again. Nobody spoke for a minute. Then Meg said in an altered tone, You know the reason Mother proposed not having any presents this Christmas was because it is going to be a hard winter for everyone. And she thinks we ought not to spend money for pleasure. <coughs> Her men are suffering so in the army. We can't do much, but we can make our little sacrifices and ought to do it gladly. But I am afraid I don't. And Meg shook her head. As, though she, as she thought regretfully of all the pretty things she wanted. But I don't think the little we should spend would do any good. We've each got a dollar and the army wouldn't be much helped by our giving that. I agree not to expect anything from mother or you, but I do want to buy Undine and Sintram for myself. I've wanted it so long, said Joe, who was a bookworm. So we see from the footnote that it's a book that Joe wants. And we get a description of her as a bookworm. I planned to spend mine on new, in new music, said Beth, with a little sigh, which no one heard, but the hearth brush and the kettle holder. I shall get a nice box of Faber's drawing pencils. I really need them, said Amy decidedly. Mother didn't say anything about our money, and she won't wish us to give up everything. Let's each buy what we want and have a little fun. I'm sure we work hard enough to earn it, cried Joe, examining the heels of her shoes in a gentlemanly manner. I know I do, teaching those tiresome children nearly all day when I'm longing to enjoy myself at home, began Meg in the complaining tone again. You don't have half such a hard time as I do, said Joe. How would you like to be shut up for hours with a nervous, fussy old lady who keeps you trotting, is never satisfied, and worries you till you're ready to fly out of the window or cry? It's naughty to fret, but I do think washing dishes and keeping things tidy is the worst work in the world. It makes me cross and my hands get so stiff. I can't practice well at all. And Beth looked at her rough hands with a sigh that anyone could hear that time. I don't believe any of you suffer as I do, cried Amy, for you don't have to go to school with impertinent girls who plague you if you don't know your lessons and laugh at your dresses and label your father if he isn't rich and insult you when your nose isn't nice. If you mean libel, I'd say so, and not talk about labels as if Papa was a pickle bottle, advised Joe, laughing. I know what I mean. 
You needn't be satirical about it. It's proper to use good words and improve your vocabulary, returned Amy with dignity. Okay, so we got kind of like a little glimpse at each of the girls right now. So we learned that Meg is what's called a governess, which if you think about what we talked about with our notes, this is where we talked about this sort of wealthy families hiring uh, a governess or a tutor who teaches a small group of students. And so that's what Meg does for her job. Joe is kind of like a caretaker. Um, we'll meet who she's a caretaker for later, but she goes and spends time with an elderly woman and helps her out. Um, but it sounds like it's difficult, right? It's difficult. Beth is at home and she helps with taking care of the house. So she helps with dishes and laundry and cooking and things like that is her job. And then Amy is the youngest. And so she goes to school. Um, and so she's kind of complaining about that. They're all complaining about their jobs to some degree. Um, but we also get this little glimpse into Amy where she is trying to use these big words, but she isn't doing it correctly, right? She meant to say libel, but she said label. She meant to say satirical, but she said statirical. She meant to say vocabulary, but she said vocabulary. So she kind of has a tough time with her, with her words, and Joe is usually the first to point it out to her. Don't peck at one another, children. Don't you wish we had the money Papa lost when we were little, Joe? Dear me, how happy and good we'd be if we had no worries, said Meg, who could remember better times. So we get this indication that they have lost some of their money. We don't really know why or how that happened, but that they used to have more of it, and now they really don't have um, much anymore. Um, now, they're not destitute. They're not impoverished. They have enough. They have a home and you'll meet later. They have a servant and you know they have enough money to be comfortable but not as much as they once had and you'll see that it's really in comparison to their friends. Their friends are able to not have to work and they have a lot of uh they go on a lot of outings and and have a lot of clothing and so there's that's more what they're feeling is that it, they don't have what everyone else has around them I should say. You said the other day you thought we were a deal happier than the king children, for they were fighting and fretting all the time in spite of their money. So I did, Beth. Well, I think we are, for though we do have to work, we make fun for ourselves and are a pretty jolly set, as Joe would say. Joe does use such slang words, observed Amy, with a reproving look at the long figure stretched on the rug. Joe immediately sat up, put her hands in her pockets and began to whistle. Don't, Joe, it's so boyish. That's why I do it. I detest rude, unladylike girls. I hate affected niminy piminy chits. So when we talk about this sort of like women being expected to be proper or ladylike, this gives you a glimpse of what I'm talking about, okay? That they're not supposed to put their hands in their pockets, they're not supposed to whistle, so these proper, appropriate, ladylike behavior is pretty limiting, right? Not, some of these things are, you know, we would say, what, that's silly, but no, not supposed to put hands in their pockets, not supposed to whistle. Birds in their little nests agree, sang Beth the peacemaker, with such a funny face that both sharp voices softened to a laugh and the pecking ended for that time. Really, girls, you are both to be blamed, said Meg, beginning to lecture in her elder sisterly fashion. You are old enough to leave off boyish tricks and to behave better, Josephine. It didn't matter so much when you were a little girl, but now you are so tall and turn up your hair and you should remember that you are a young lady. I'm not. And if turning up my hair makes me one, I'll wear it in two tails till I'm 20, cried Jo, pulling off her net and shaking down a chestnut mane. I hate to think that I've got to grow up and be Miss March and wear long gowns and look as prim as a china aster. It's bad enough to be a girl anyway when I like boys' games and work and manners. I can't get over my disappointment in not being a boy, and it's worse than ever now, for I'm dying to go and fight with Papa, and I can only stay at home and knit like a pokey old woman. And Joe shook the blue army sock till the needles rattled like castanets, and her ball bounded across the room. Poor Joe, it's too bad, but it can't be helped. So you must try to be contented with making your name boyish and playing brother to us girls, said Beth, stroking the rough head at her knee with a hand that all the dishwashing and dusting in the world could not make ungentle in its touch. As for you, Amy, continued Meg, you are altogether too particular and prim. Your airs are funny and now, but you'll grow up an affected little goose if you don't take care. 
I like your nice manners and refined ways of speaking when you don't try to be elegant, but your absurd words are as bad as Joe's slang. So we see Meg kind of lecturing the girls a little bit and the oldest sister, and she's telling Joe that she needs to kind of grow up and stop being so boyish, quote unquote boyish, right? And then she's telling Amy, Amy's kind of stuck up, I guess is the best way to describe it, that she is trying to appear very proper, but it kind of has her being a little bit um, arrogant and a little bit stuck up. And so Meg's giving her a lecture about that too. If Joe is a tomboy and Amy a goose, what am I please? Asked Beth, ready to share the lecture. You're a deer and nothing else, answered Meg warmly. And no one contradicted her for the mouse was the pet of the family. As young readers like to know how people look, we will take this moment to give them a little sketch of the four sisters who sat knitting away in the twilight while the December snow fell quietly without and the fire crackled cheerfully within. <clears throat> it was a comfortable old room, though the carpet was faded and the furniture very plain. For a good picture or two hung on the walls, books filled the recesses, chrysanthemums and Christmas roses bloomed in the windows, and a pleasant atmosphere of home peace pervaded it. Margaret, the eldest of the four, so we're getting, we're going to get a lot of description in this paragraph, so this would be a great place to look for two, three, four, five, two, three, four, five, yeah. Margaret, the eldest of the four, was 16, very pretty, being plump and fair, with large eyes, plenty of soft brown hair, a sweet mouth, and white hands, of which she was rather vain. 15-year-old Joe was very tall, thin, and brown, and reminded one of a colt, for she never seemed to know what to do with her long limbs, which were very much in her way. She had a decided mouth, a comical nose, and sharp gray eyes, which appeared to see everything, and were by turns fierce, funny, or thoughtful. Her long, thick hair was her one beauty, but it was usually bundled into a net to be out of her way. Round shoulders had Joe, big hands and feet, a flyaway look to her clothes, and an uncomfortable appearance of a girl who was rapidly shooting up into a woman and didn't like it. Elizabeth, or Beth, as everyone called her, was a rosy, smooth-haired, bright-eyed girl of 13, with a shy manner, a timid voice, and a peaceful expression which was seldom disturbed. Her father called her Little Tranquility, and the name suited her exceedingly, for she seemed to live in a happy world of her own, only venturing out to meet the few whom she trusted and loved. Amy, though the youngest, was a most important person, in her own opinion, at least. A regular snow maiden with blue eyes and yellow hair curling on her shoulders, pale and slender, and always carrying herself like a young lady mindful of her manners. With the characters, what the characters of the four sisters were, we le will leave to be found out. So we see a little bit about each of them and we learn a little bit about each of them. We also learn their names. So Margaret is her full name, the oldest, but she goes by Meg. Josephine goes by Joe. Elizabeth goes by um, Beth. And then Amy is just Amy. And sometimes you'll hear people call Meg Peggy, but that's pretty, pretty rare, pretty rare, okay? The clock struck six and having swept up the hearth, Beth put a pair of slippers down to warm. Somehow the sight of the old shoes had a good effect upon the girls, for mother was coming and everyone brightened to welcome her. Meg stopped lecturing and lighted the lamp. Amy got out of the easy chair without being asked and Joe forgot how tired she was as she sat up to hold the slippers nearer to the blaze. They are quite worn out. Marmy must have a new pair. I thought I'd get her some with my dollar, said Beth. No, I shall, cried Amy. I'm the oldest, began Meg, but Joe cut in with a decided, I'm the man of the family now. Papa is away, and I shall provide the slippers, for he told me to take special care of Mother while he was gone. I'll tell you what we'll do, said Beth. Let's each get her something for Christmas, and not anything for ourselves. That's like you, dear. What shall we get, exclaimed Joe. Everyone thought soberly for a minute. Then Meg announced, as if the idea was suggested by the sight of her own pretty hands, I shall give her a nice pair of gloves. Army shoes, best to be had, cried Joe. Some handkerchiefs all hemmed, said Beth. I'll get a little bottle of cologne. She likes it, and it won't cost much, so I'll have some left to buy my pencils, added Amy. How will we give the things, asked Meg. Put them on the table and bring her in and see her open the bundles. 
Don't you remember how we used to do on our birthdays, answered Joe. I used to be so frightened when it was my turn to sit in the big chair with the crown on and see you all come marching round to give the presents with a kiss. I liked the things and the kisses, but it was dreadful to have you sit looking at me while I opened the bundles, said Beth, who was toasting her face and the bread for tea at the same time. So we've seen some hints about this from Beth, but she tends to be pretty shy and doesn't like a lot of attention. And so this is coming up a couple times in this chapter. Let Marmy think we are getting things for ourselves. And then surprise her. We must go shopping tomorrow afternoon, Meg. There is so much to do about the play for Christmas night, said Jo, marching up and down with her hands behind her back and her nose in the air. We also learn there that what did the girls call their mother? They call her Marmy. So when we hear Marmy, that's them referring to their mom. I don't mean to act any more after this time. I'm getting too old for such things, observed Meg, who was as much a child as ever about dressing up frolics. You won't stop, I know, as long as you can trail round in a white gown with your hair down and wear gold paper jewelry. You are the best actress we've got, and there'll be an end of everything if you quit the board, said Joe. We ought to rehearse tonight. Come here, Amy, and do the fainting scene, for you are as stiff as a poker in that. I can't help it. I never saw anyone faint, and I don't choose to make myself all black and blue, tumbling flat as you do. If I can go down easily, I'll drop. If I can't, I shall fall into a chair and be graceful. I don't care if Hugo does come at me with a pistol, returned Amy, who was not gifted with dramatic power, but was chosen because she was small enough to be borne out shrieking by the villain of the piece. Do it this way. Clasp your hands so and stagger across the room, crying frantically, Roderigo, save me, save me! And away went Joe with a melodramatic scream, which was truly thrilling. Amy followed, but she poked her hands out stiffly before her and jerked herself along as if she went by machinery. And her ow was more suggestive of pins being run into her than of fear and anguish. Joe gave a despairing groan and Meg laughed outright, while Beth let her bread burn as she watched the fun with interest. It's no use. Do the best you can when the time comes, and if the audience laughs, don't blame me. Come on, Meg. Then things went smoothly for Don Pedro defied. So we're going to see there. What they're talking about is that they put on a play. Joe writes these plays and then they act them out. And so Don Pedro, right, and Rodrigo, these are characters in the play that they're acting out. Then things went smoothly for Don Pedro defied the world in a speech of two pages without a single break. Hagar, the witch, chanted an awful incantation over her kettle full of simmering toads with weird effect. Rodrigo rent his chains asunder manfully, and Hugo died in agonies of remorse and arsenic, which is a type of poison, with a wild, ha ha! It's the best we've had yet, said Meg, as the dead villain sat up and rubbed his elbows. I don't see how you can write and act such splendid things, Joe. You're a regular Shakespeare, exclaimed Beth, who firmly believed that her sisters were gifted with wonderful genius in all things. Not quite, replied Joe modestly. I do think the witch's curse, an operatic tragedy, is a rather nice thing, but I'd like to try Macbeth, if only we had a trap door for Banquo. I always wanted to do the killing part. Is that a dagger that I see before me? muttered Joe, rolling her eyes and clutching at the air as she had seen a famous tragedian do. No, it's the toasting fork with mother's shoe on it instead of the bread. Beth stage struck, cried Meg, and the rehearsal ended in a general burst of laughter. Glad to find you so merry, my girls, said a cheery voice at the door, and actors and audience turned to welcome a tall motherly lady with a can I help you look about her, which was truly delightful. She was not elegantly dressed, but a noble looking woman, and the girls thought the gray cloak and, and unfashionable bonnet covered the most splendid mother in the world. Well, dearies, how have you got on today? There was so much to do getting the boxes ready to go tomorrow that I didn't come home to dinner. Has anyone called, Beth? How is your cold, Meg? Joe, you look tired to death. Come and kiss me, baby. While making these maternal inquiries, Mrs. March got her wet things off, her warm slippers on, and sitting down in the easy chair, drew Amy to her lap, preparing to enjoy the happiest hour of her busy day. The girls flew about trying to make things comfortable, each in her own way. Meg arranged the tea table. Joe brought wood and set chairs, dropping, overturning, and clattering everything she touched. Beth trotted to and fro between the parlor and kitchen, 
quiet and busy, while Amy gave directions to everyone as she sat with her hands folded. As they gathered about the table, Mrs. March said with a particularly happy face, I've got a treat for you after supper. A quick bright smile went round like a streak of sunshine. Beth clapped her hands regardless of the biscuit she held and Joe tossed up her napkin crying, a letter, a letter, three cheers for father. So the surprise it sounds like is a letter from their dad. Yes, a nice long letter. He is well and thinks he shall get through the cold season better than we feared. He sends all sorts of loving wishes for Christmas and an especial message to you girls, said Mrs. March, putting her pocket as if she had got it, patting her pocket as if she had got a treasure there. Hurry and get done. Don't stop to quirk your little finger and simper over your plate, Amy, cried Jo, choking in her tea and dropping her bread butter side down on the carpet in her haste to get at the treat. Beth ate no more, but crept away to sit in her shadowy corner and brood over the delight to come till the others were ready. I think it was so splendid in father to go as a chaplain when he was too old to be drafted and not strong enough for a, a soldier, said Meg warmly. So we see that their dad is not actually as a sh acting as a soldier at the moment, but he's there as a chaplain, which is sort of like a spiritual guide for people, and who for the soldiers who are fighting. Don't I wish I could go as a drummer, a vivan, what's its name, or a nurse, so I could be near him and help him, exclaimed Joe with a groan. It must be very disagreeable to sleep in a tent and eat all sorts of bad tasting things and drink out of a tin mug, sighed Amy. When will he come home, Marmy? asked Beth with a little quiver in her voice. Not for many months, dear, unless he is sick. He will stay and do his work faithfully as long as he can. And he won't, and we won't ask for him back a minute sooner than he can be spared. Now come and hear the letter. They all drew to the fire. Mother in a big chair with Beth at her feet, Meg and Amy perched on either arm of the chair and Joe leaning on the back where no one would see any sign of emotion if the letter should happen to be touching. So Joe's kind of hiding so no one will see her cry if she starts crying. Very few letters were written in those hard times that were not touching, especially those which fathers sent home. In this one, little was said of the hardships endured, the dangers faced, or the homesickness conquered. It was a cheerful, hopeful letter, full of lively descriptions of camp life, marches, and military news. And only at the end did the writer's heart overflow with fatherly love and longing for the little girls at home. Give them all, my dear love, give them all my dear love and a kiss. Tell them I think of them by day, pray for them by night, and find my best comfort in their affection at all times. A year seems very long to wait before I see them, but remind them that while we wait, we may all work so that these hard days need not be wasted. I know they will remember all I said to them, that they will be loving children to you, will do their duty faithfully, fight their bosom enemies bravely, and conquer themselves so beautifully that when I come back to them, I may be fonder and prouder than ever of my little women. Everybody sniffed when they came to that part. Joe wasn't ashamed of the great tear that dropped off at the end of her nose, and Amy never minded the rumpling of her curls as she hid her face on her mother's shoulder and sobbed out, I am a selfish girl, but I'll truly try to be better so he mayn't be disappointed in me by and by. We all will, cried Meg. I think too much of my looks and hate to work, but won't any more if I can help it. I'll try and be what he loves to call me, a little woman, and not be rough and wild, but do my duty here instead of wanting to be somewhere else, said Joe, thinking that keeping her temper at home was a much harder task than facing a rebel or two down south. Beth said nothing, but wiped away her tears with the blue army sock and began to knit with all her might, losing no time in doing the duty that lay nearest her, while she resolved in her quiet little soul to be all that father hoped to find her when hoped to find her when the year brought round the happy coming home. Mrs. March broke the silence that followed Joe's words by saying in her cheery voice, do you remember how you used to play Pilgrim's Progress when you were little things? Nothing delighted you more than having to, having me, excuse me, delighted you more than to have me tie my peace bags on your backs for burdens and give you hats and sticks and rolls of paper and let you travel through the house from the cellar, which was the city of destruction, up, up to the housetop where you had all the lovely things you could collect to make a celestial city. 
So this is again referring to Pilgrim's Progress, right? So in this book, there's sort of like a journey that's happening. So the girls, when they were young, would pretend to play it. So imagine a book that you really like, that you guys could pretend to be characters of it, and you're kind of acting it out. And so that's what they would do. They would act out this book, Pilgrim's Progress, that they had loved and, loved, and they would wander through their house just like the characters in the book would wander through this part uh, or this town or this, I don't know, it's not even a town, but um, wandering from city to city, okay? What fun it was, especially going by the lions, fighting Apollyon and passing through the valley where the hobgoblins were, said Joe. I liked the place where the bundles fell off and tumbled downstairs, said Meg. My favorite part was when we came out on the flat roof where our flowers and arbors and pretty things were and all stood and sung for joy up there in the sunshine, said Beth, smiling as if that pleasant moment had come back to her. I don't remember much about it, except that I was afraid of the cellar and the dark entry and always liked the cake and milk we had up at the top. If I wasn't too old for such things, I'd rather like to play it over again, said Amy, who began to talk of renouncing childish things at the mature age of 12. So our narrator is indicating that Amy kind of thinks she's older than she is or is affecting to be older than she is. We never are too old for this, my dear, because it is a play we are playing all the time in one way or another. Our burdens are here, our road before us, and the longing for goodness and happiness is the guide that leads us through many troubles and mistakes to the peace which is a true celestial city. Now, my little pilgrims, suppose you begin again, not in play, but in earnest, and see how far on you can get before Father comes home. So Marmy is telling them that they should play, quote unquote, play Pilgrim's Progress by trying to improve themselves, right? She's talking about the burdens that they carry, which would be like their weaknesses or the things that they need to improve in or grow in, their character flaws, and that they can journey through every day trying to improve themselves. So she's encouraging them to keep playing Pilgrim's Progress by trying to grow in virtue each day so that by the time their dad comes home he can come and see wow they've all really worked on various things and we're going to see throughout the book what are some of those growth areas that they each have things that they want to work on really mother where are our bundles asked amy who was a very literal young lady each of you told what your burden was just now except beth i rather think she hasn't got any said her mother Yes, I have. Mine is dishes and dusters and envying girls with nice pianos and being afraid of people. Beth's bundle was such a funny one that everybody wanted to laugh, but nobody did, for it would have hurt her feelings very much. So Meg talks a little bit about how she um, is too vain, right? She thinks too much of her looks. And Joe reflects on how she's got too much of a temper. And Beth just shares that she's Got to work on maybe not being so afraid of people and not hating her work so much. And Amy talks about being too selfish. So they're all kind of reflecting on ways in which they could improve. Let's do it, said Meg thoughtfully. It is only another name for trying to be good. And the story may help us. For though we do want to be good, it's hard work and we forget and don't do our best. We were in the slough of despond tonight, and Mother came up and pulled us out as help did in the book. We ought to have our role of directions like Christians. So they're talking about characters in the book. What shall we do about that, asked Joe, delighted with the fancy which lent a little romance to the very dull task of doing her duty. Look under your pillows Christmas morning, and you will find your guidebook, replied Mrs. March. They talked over the new plan while old Hannah cleared the table. Then out came the four little work baskets and the needles flew as the girls made sheets for Aunt March. It was uninteresting sewing, but tonight no one grumbled. They adopted Joe's plan of dividing the long seams into four parts and calling the quarters Europe, Asia, Africa, and America. And in that way, they got on capitally, especially when they talked about the different countries as they stitched their way through them. At nine, they stopped work and sang as usual before they went to bed. No one but Beth could get much music out of the old piano, but she had a way of softly touching the yellow keys and making a pleasant accompaniment that the simple songs they sang, to the simple songs they sang. Meg had a voice like a flute, and she and her mother led the little choir. Amy chirped like a cricket, and Joe wandered through the airs at her own sweet will, always coming out at the wrong place with a croak or a quaver that spoiled the most pensive tune. They had always done this from the time they could lisp, crinkle, crinkle, little tar. And it had become a household custom, for the mother was a born singer. 
The first sound in the morning was her voice as she went about the house singing like a lark. And the last sound at night was the same cheery sound for the girls never grew too old for that familiar lullaby. All right, fifth graders, I know today was a long lesson. We had our introduction and our first chapter, but at this point, you should be ready to go ahead and start working on that, the homework questions, including understanding a little bit more about each of the girls' characters. Okay, good luck and let me know if you need help.